You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. Hello, and welcome to episode 358 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. When we think about early America, many of our minds generate maps of the eastern seaboard of North America. In our eastern and middle state school systems, this is how we're taught to think about early America, as English and later British America. But as we know from listening to this podcast and from our West Coast educations, looking upon early America as a period that only took place on the eastern seaboard of North America paints an incomplete picture. It conceals the existence of indigenous peoples who lived in North America for thousands of years before the arrival of Europeans. And it leads to the notion that the English were the first Europeans to establish colonies in North America. But in reality, the English were actually latecomers to the continent. Before the English came the French and the Dutch, and before the French and the Dutch came the Spanish. Now, Spain claimed almost the entirety of the North American continent as its territory and it established large colonial administrative units to govern that territory, at least on paper. One administrative unit was New Spain, which included all lands north of the Isthmus of Panama that continued north to about the Oregon border, and then east from California to Louisiana. A second administrative unit that Spain created was called La Florida, which on maps might encompass all lands east of Louisiana, inclusive of the Caribbean islands and north to Newfoundland. But in practice, actually just encompassed the Florida Peninsula and the Gulf Coast region from Florida through Louisiana. Charles Tingley, a senior research librarian at the St. Augustine Historical Society in St. Augustine, Florida, joins us to explore La Florida and its early American history from the vantage point of one of La Florida's capitals, the city of St. Augustine. Now, during our exploration, Charles reveals how and why the Spanish founded a colony at St. Augustine, Florida the layout and appearance of colonial St. Augustine and the makeup of its people, and the journey of St. Augustine and Florida from a Spanish colony to a British colony, back to a Spanish colony, and then finally as the 27th state of the United States. But first, did you know that Ben Franklin's World has a listener-led and listener-driven book club? Poor Richard's book club was created and is hosted by listeners just like yourself. Each meeting features a discussion of a new chapter from books that we've either discussed on this podcast or will discuss on this show. Plus, the club's organizers, Shari and Heather, always bring in guests and readers just like yourself to lead each conversation. For more information about how you can join the Poor Richards Book Club and meet up with fellow listeners, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash book club. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash book club. All right. Are you ready to spend your history spring break in La Florida? Let's go meet our guest historian. Joining us is a senior research librarian at the St. Augustine Historical Society in St. Augustine, Florida. He's an expert on the history of St. Augustine, and today, he joins us to discuss that city's earliest history. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Charles Tingley. It's a great pleasure to be here, Liz. So, Charles, I understand from our little pre-episode talk that we had before our conversation began that you have a connection to Ben Franklin and his world. Yes. My direct ancestor, Captain Samuel Tingley, was a sea captain in the 18th century, and he was frequently quoted as a news source in Franklin's Pennsylvania Gazette newspaper. And one of those directly relates to St. Augustine. In the 21st of August, 1740 issue of the Pennsylvania Gazette, there is a quote, Captain Tingley arrived Thursday last at New York from Georgia with news that the siege of St. Augustine was raised. That would be General Oglethorpe's siege during the War of Jenkins' ear. So there's a surprising direct connection there. It's an interesting connection, too, and one that I think speaks to the importance of St. Augustine, which is not a history we talk a lot about when we talk about early America, but Ben Franklin and other printers in their British American newspapers spent a fair amount of time 
discussing St. Augustine in the 18th century. Yes, a lot of the significance of St. Augustine is that it was the northern edge of the Spanish Empire. And it's the touch point from where the imperial powers of France and Britain and Spain clashed. Now, St. Augustine is a very old city. The Spanish founded St. Augustine in 1565, 42 years before the English established their colony at Jamestown, and 55 years before the English established their colony at Plymouth. Charles, before we dig into the rich history of St. Augustine, would you tell us why the Spanish worked to establish colonies north of Mexico and along the Atlantic coast of North America? What was it that drew the Spanish to Florida and to St. Augustine in particular? Well, a lot of people don't realize that when Juan Ponce de Leon explored this area in 1513, he made a discovery that was, in all likelihood, far more important than a peninsula north of Cuba, which actually appears on a 1503 map. So we just refer to Ponce as the first official visitor. But he discovered the Gulf Stream. And the Gulf Stream provided a fast trading route from the Spanish colonies in the New World back to Europe. The trade between Europe and America was a largely circular trade with the treasure from Mexico and Bolivia and other points in the empire being collected in Havana, Cuba, and then a great fleet, La Flota, using the Gulf Stream along the shore of Florida and across the Atlantic to speed their voyage back. And then ships coming from Spain would use the trade winds starting in southern Spain with the ports of Cadiz and then onto the Canary Islands and take a southerly route with usually their first port of call being San Juan, Puerto Rico. So that circular pattern needed to be protected from other European powers and from pirates. So having a settlement in the peninsula of Florida provided a Coast Guard station more than anything else for the Spanish. From what I've read about the early history of Florida is that it actually took the Spanish quite some time to find the right place in Florida to establish their first permanent colonial settlement. Would you tell us a bit about this history, Charles, and what drove the Spanish to the Atlantic coast of Florida? Was it just these trade winds and a need to establish a Coast Guard station? Well, it wasn't for want of trying. As I just mentioned, Juan Ponce de Leon saw the peninsula in 1513, and he came back in 1521. But there were other explorations and other attempts at colonization. The earliest attempt at a true colony was in 1526 by Lucas Vasquez de Aleon, who brought 600 colonists and tried to establish a settlement near Georgia. But we have the explorations of Panfilo de Navarre in 1528, Hernando de Soto in 1539. Tristan de Luna made a huge settlement attempt in 1559 on the Bay of Pensacola, which only lasted a few months because it got wiped out by a hurricane. Lucas Vasquez de Aleon's settlement failed because he died. And then we had the French arrival in 1562. So Jean Rabot established Charles Fort after first landing in St. Augustine, which he called the River of Dolphins. But then he decided to go up the coast, and he found a good port at Port Royal and established a fort at what's now Paris Island, South Carolina. But the small garrison that he left behind, they lasted for only a few months before they built a ship and left to return to France, experiencing horrendous conditions, including cannibalism, on the way back. Then, in 1564, René de Laudinière, another Frenchman, tries to establish a colony in the southeast North America again, and he establishes what is today called Fort Caroline at the mouth of the St. John's River. And it's that settlement that Menendez wiped out the following fall in 1565. And this fight between the French and the Spanish is the first battle between European powers for dominance in North America. So it's really significant from a geopolitical point of view. So as I said, there were many attempts at both exploration and colonization, and it's just by hook or by crook, Menendez's settlement in 1565 is the one that stayed. 
that's a really interesting history because it's also a history that highlights that colonization was about experimentation and trying to find the right conditions and the right places to set up new colonial settlements. And finding these right conditions didn't always work out. And that's something we can clearly see in your description of all of the different explorations and settlement attempts in early Florida. No, and in fact, Menendez, with his establishment of St. Augustine, he came into this harbor because the French already had the settlement at the mouth of the St. John's River. But then the French came down and tried attacking, but there was a hurricane, and it's a long, complicated story, and the French fleet was wrecked. But after he got rid of the French presence, he went back to where the initial French settlement was on Paris Island, South Carolina, and established the town called Santa Elena. And he intended that to be his capital, because one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is the French and the Spanish concept of Florida is much larger than the current state of Florida. That's why frequently historians refer to it as La Florida, because it really included everything between Newfoundland and New Spain along the Atlantic and Gulf shores of North America. So it was also sometimes referred to as the continent of Florida. We have to recognize that they were trying to establish a much broader and larger colonial effort, and they had to scale it back, whether it was because they didn't find any mineral wealth that was usable or whether the Indians were too hostile but it was dramatically scaled back. And eventually, after only about 10 years, Santa Elena was abandoned, and the Spanish determined that all they needed for a Coast Guard station and for a missionizing post for the Franciscan mission was St. Augustine. And St. Augustine continues then under Spanish rule until 1763. Would you help us place St. Augustine on our mental maps of Florida? For those of us who may not be familiar with the geography of Florida, If we're looking at a map of the state, would you give us a rundown of what we would see if we were looking at that map from north to south? Well, St. Augustine is about 60 miles south of the Georgia-Florida line along the seacoast. So we're south of the St. Johns River where Jacksonville is. And the Spanish used St. Augustine as a jumping off point for establishing Franciscan missions along the Atlantic shoreline as far north as South Carolina and into the interior in the area of Gainesville, Florida, where the University of Florida is, and on over into the Tallahassee area. There were 64 Franciscan missions in total, which is more than the number of Franciscan missions in California and Arizona combined. So in addition to being this Coast Guard station to protect the Spanish treasure fleets coming out of Havana, or to rescue the wrecked seamen along the shoreline, most famously occurring in 1715 when the entire fleet was wrecked near Vero Beach. It was a major point of missionization, and the Native Americans were a major reason for keeping St. Augustine as a Spanish settlement. And that raises another interesting question. If Florida had more Franciscan missions than California and Arizona combined, Who was living in the area of St. Augustine before the Spanish arrived? What do we know about the indigenous inhabitants of the St. Augustine area? Well, we know from archaeological evidence that the St. Augustine vicinity has been inhabited since right after the last ice age, so for about 6,000 years. Some of the earliest pottery in North America has been located here. It's called Orange Period Pottery. The inhabitants early on Archaeologists refer to as Paleo-Indians because they're using stone tools. But other than the excavations, we don't know really anything about them. And their pottery is distinctively different from the peoples at the time of Spanish contact, which are generally referred to as the Tamuqua, which was a large linguistic group, much like the Iroquois. It wasn't a tribe. It was a linguistic group covering all of northeast portion of the state of Florida today. The village in the vicinity of St. Augustine was called Siloy, and the chiefs were generally called after the name of their village. So Chief Siloy, when Menendez arrived in typical Native American hospitality, turned over his longhouse to his guests. 
And so Menendez and his men immediately moved into the longhouse and set about fortifying it. Well, about eight months later, the Indians had had enough of their guests, and they shot fire arrows into the longhouse, which just had a palm thatch roof, and burned it down. And at that time, the Spanish moved over to Anastasia Island, which is on the opposite shore of Manhansas Bay, where the town is today. And they were over there until 1572, until finally the Indians' situation had become safe enough for them to move the settlement back across the bay where it was more convenient. And I love the phrase that the governor uses to create a rationale to the king for moving the settlement, because he said, the fort was being eaten by the waves. So we had coastal erosion even then. What was the situation between the Tamuqua speaking people and their new Spanish neighbors? Because it sounds like at times the Spanish may have been annoying. They overstayed their welcome in that longhouse. And the only way that the Tamuqua could get them to move out of it was to shoot fire arrows and burn the house down. So how did relations go from burning down the Spanish longhouse to becoming safe enough for the Spanish to live near the Tamuqua in the area that is now St. Augustine? Well, as is the case in much of Latin America, there's initial hostility to the conquistadors. But then because of the overwhelming superiority of Spanish technology for making war, and because of the spread of disease amongst the Indians, European diseases, there becomes a demoralization of the native population that is like, how can we combat this? They have guns and gunpowder and steel swords, and we don't have anything that can truly combat that. And then whenever we come in contact with them, we're dying in vast numbers for disease. So the mortality amongst the Native Americans was horrific during this time period. And as I said, whether it was Mexico or Florida, that had a very demoralizing effect. And then the Franciscan missions come along in the 1570s saying, we will save your soul and you will live eternally in paradise. And that was a very welcome message to these people who were dying. Today, it's pretty common for people to refer to St. Augustine as the oldest continuously occupied European and African-American settlement in the United States. So, Charles, would you tell us about the Spaniards' work to establish the town that we now know as St. Augustine? Sure. Pedro Menendez de Aviles had a specific contract with the king of Spain, Philip II, as to what his obligations were and what the king's obligations were. And this is a very detailed contract that gave him the title in perpetuity of Adelantado de la Florida, which the title Adelantado essentially means conquering governor. And other explorers, whether it was Juan Ponce de Leon or Hernandez de Soto, had also been given that title, but they weren't successful. And even today, the descendants of Pedro Menendez's nephew, because Menendez himself had no children who had children, his nephew's descendants in Spain today use the title Adelantado de la Florida. They were to be given so much land, they were to be given mineral rights, all this that any Spanish conquistador would have wanted in a contract that he and his family were going to be wealthy from establishing this colony. But he had to foot the bill for bringing settlers, for ships, for supplying his military forces with supplies. And this went on for about 20 years with the family of Pedro Menendez, because he dies in the 1570s. And then the crown says, you know, this is not working out and makes it a crown colony. So it was a proprietary colony at first, much like Pennsylvania or Maryland with the Calverts. But then it transitions more like South Carolina, stop being a proprietary colony and becomes a crown colony later in the colonial experience. So these obligations were complicated. Dr. Eugene Lyon has written a fabulous book many years ago called The Enterprise of Florida. So anybody who wants to know more about how the Florida Peninsula and St. Augustine was established. I also want one point of clarity in that when we started using the oldest city as a catchphrase after the Civil War, Puerto Rico was not part of the United States. 
So we often say the continental United States. Your comparison of Florida's transition between a proprietary colony to a crown colony with other colonial projects in North America makes me wonder how the establishment of St. Augustine compared with other colonial projects in North America. So when we think of colonies established by the French, the Dutch, or the English, we know that a lot of single men migrated in search of their fortunes. And if we look at colonies such as Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, we can see that it was actually a lot of families who made up the earliest groups of colonists. So Charles, who settled St. Augustine for the Spanish and how did the Spanish work to sell St. Augustine to potential settlers back in Spain or in other colonies? Well, even from the very beginning, women were part of the colony. Blacks, both free and enslaved, were part of the colony. So far as selling it to people, so many people in Spain where soils were depleted and they had heard tales of the vast wealth of Mexico and Peru wanted any ticket that they could get to get to the New World and find fortune for themselves. So later in the late 17th and 18th century, there's an interesting phenomenon in that the Spanish had settled the Canary Islands about 50 years before Columbus's voyages. And by the time of the 17th and 18th century, they were becoming overpopulated. And the merchants in the Canaries struck a deal with the King of Spain to make the Canaries free ports with tax advantages if they would provide settlers to the New World colonies. It's sometimes referred to as the blood tax. So many of the 17th and 18th century settlers came from the Canary Islands. You find this also true in Puerto Rico, in southern Cuba, in Cartagena, in Colombia. But this said, there were women from the very beginning. A year or so after Menendez's first settlement, there was another fleet, much larger, that had a more complete population of children and women and families and farmers and skilled craftsmen to establish a colony here. The problem they ran up against is the resources on the sandy coast of Florida are not the best. So unless you like to eat a lot of fish and Indian corn doesn't bother you because you can't grow wheat here, it's a problem. And oftentimes, St. Augustine was considered the last resort for colonists coming from the old world. And many times it's where convicts from Havana, for instance, would be sent. So we're really talking about a population or at least an initial population for St. Augustine that came not necessarily from Spain, but from these settlements on the Canary Islands or from other Spanish colonies in the Caribbean. Well, the initial population that Menendez brought and the Second Fleet were largely from Asturias in northern Spain. Later on, it's more people from Andalusia and from the Canaries. And also, people come from Mexico and other places in the Spanish colonies. The earliest Spanish child that we know born in St. Augustine, Martin Arguiles, who was born in 1566, he later moved and became a government official in the Yucatan and has hundreds, if not thousands, of descendants. It's time for us to do a bit of time travel and visit St. Augustine, maybe 50 years after its initial settlement. But first, before we travel back in time, let's take a moment to thank our episode sponsor. Are you ready to commemorate Juneteenth? Consider coming to Colonial Williamsburg for a new event. To commemorate the triumphant spirit of the African-American journey, the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation will host a Juneteenth sunrise service on Sunday, June 18 at 6 a.m. The service will take place at the majestic Compton Oak on Market Square, as the Compton Oak is a landmark tree that symbolizes life, endurance, shelter, and joy. The ceremony will also include a special keynote address by visionary thought leader Tina Lifford. For more information about Juneteenth and commemorating the holiday here at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Juneteenth. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash Juneteenth. Charles, if we could travel back in time and visit St. Augustine maybe 50 years after its initial settlement, what kind of colonial city would we see? Would you take us through who we would meet, what we would hear, and maybe what the buildings would look like as we're walking around town? Yes. In 1572, Philip II promulgated probably the most influential planning document in the history of the world. It's called the New Ordinances of the Indies. 
And there's about a 10-page description of how to lay out new towns. And of course, St. Augustine was destroyed by Sir Francis Drake's attack in 1586. So in the rebuilding after that attack in the 1790s, Governor Gonzalo Mendez de Canzo reports back to the king that he has laid out a town according to the new ordinances and established a market. So it's our first reference to a European-style market in North America. It's also the first example of European-style land planning. And those streets, and even the ones that were destroyed by Sir Francis Drake in 1586, the town was about nine blocks south of the plaza. And we know from archaeology that those streets you can still walk down today. And that's why the town plan of St. Augustine is a National Historic Landmark, because it's the earliest example of European land planning in the United States. So it was, yes, an organized town on a grid system with a central plaza, with the main public buildings, the church and the governor's house, and the guardhouse being on the main plaza, which was referred to then as the Plaza de Armas. We still have this today. The plaza is now called the Plaza de la Constitución, named after the Spanish Constitution of 1812. So this is why, with those new ordinances, there is a regularity to Spanish towns throughout the empire. Now, population-wise, you would have had a mix of Africans speaking multiple languages because they didn't all come from the same place in Africa. And then you have the Spanish that are not all from the same place in Spain. So some are from Asturias, some are from Andalusia and other places. You have mestizos from Mexico having come to St. Augustine. The family that lived on the property, which is now the oldest house, which is the St. Augustine Historical Society's House Museum, they were from Puebla, Mexico. And we have found archaeologically a volcanic stone matate which was directly imported from Mexico. So they were probably eating corn tortillas and were a mestizo family from Mexico. So it's a very polyglot population. You have Indians coming and going. The town is surrounded by five or six Franciscan missions. They would have been coming and going to the headquarters monastery on the south end of town. You have soldiers from other parts of the empire being stationed here. And then you have people who were born here. Wow. It sounds like St. Augustine, although it's in this frontier area, was actually a very modern European style colonial city in that it was also very cosmopolitan with all the different peoples and mixtures of different African and indigenous and Spanish and Spanish American cultures just kind of mixing and being used in this town. Yes, it still was a frontier settlement, though. You were at the edge of the empire. You know, at 50 years after settlement, there were probably six or 700 people. But still, you had people going to school. You had Indians learning Latin and Spanish so they can be missionized. You had merchants coming and going. While St. Augustine and Florida in general did not have any mineral wealth, there was a little bit of trade. We exported deer skins. And later on in the late 17th century, after the establishment of Charleston in 1670, it's the competition for the Indian deerskin trade that was one of the major flashpoints between the British in Charleston and the Spanish in St. Augustine. But believe it or not, one of the major exports from Florida at that time was sassafras. Sassafras was considered a cure-all, and it wasn't just for making tea, but it was considered a medicine at that time and highly valuable. Also, people would find ambergris thrown up by whales along the beach, which, you know, was worth its weight in gold. So those were some of the products until the British come in. And then you start developing other cash products, such as timber, turpentine, and indigo. What about daily life in St. Augustine? So I've been to St. Augustine. My grandparents took me. And from the road we came in on, which I think is Route 1, there's the town on the left, and then across the street from the town, there's this big military fortress, the Castillo de San Marcos, and it's right there, right on the water. And as you mentioned, Charles, St. Augustine was a frontier outpost, which really had two functions to serve. One was to serve as a hub for Franciscan missionizing activity out in the frontier areas of Florida, and then the other was to serve as a military naval depot, a Coast Guard station, if you will. They could go out and help protect the town's entrances, other Spanish colonies, 
and to save shipwrecked crews. So would you talk to us about what daily life was like in this community meant to serve these two very different functions and what daily life was like for the people of St. Augustine who weren't employed by the church or employed by the military? Well, you had a garrison that was nominally 200 men. Now, in the first Spanish period, with the pre-1763 time period, they did not live in a barracks. They either had joint housing that they rented or owned, that maybe several soldiers had gone in together and rented a small house. The town was completely made of wood up until the 1690s. Daily life would have been, if you think of, say, a small town in Guatemala today, would have not been dissimilar to that with the influence of Native Americans as well as people from Europe. Most of the people were employed by the government, whether as a soldier or as a bureaucrat. And the higher echelon bureaucrats, whether it's the governor or the treasurer or the royal accountant or the physician, their salaries were paid by a subsidy. Florida was never self-supporting for the Spanish. That subsidy came from the taxes on the city of Puebla, Mexico. And so every year, the Florida governor would send the situador, the subsidy man, to Veracruz to pick up the salaries for the entire year, and he would have a shopping list of items. So a lot of the material goods that we find archaeologically in St. Augustine, pottery is a good example. I mentioned that matate come from Mexico, not from Spain because the situador would pick it up on his annual trip to Veracruz. And that pattern continued up until 1763. The economy in Florida was pretty much barter, was not a cash economy. In fact, there are numerous letters of one of the 18th century governors trying to get authorization from the king to have minted very small denomination coins in order to enhance the economy because everything was being handled by barter. But you did have families, so you'd have these soldiers with their families. Even though there was a prohibition, technically, that local men could not be hired as soldiers because they didn't want the garrison to be influenced by family connections, but that regulation was largely winked at here because it was so hard to get troops to come here, at least before 1763. You mentioned earlier that St. Augustine had a population of enslaved and free African and later African-American men and women that also developed into one of the largest free Black communities in all of colonial North America. Would you tell us more about the Black population of St. Augustine and how St. Augustine's African and African-American inhabitants created one of the largest free Black populations in colonial North America? Well, let's make it perfectly clear that when we refer to North America, we're not talking about everything north of the Isthmus of Panama, because there were certainly large populations of Africans in Mexico and Guatemala and other places south of here. Starting in 1680, the Spanish government adopted what's referred to by historians as the slave sanctuary policy. This policy essentially said that any enslaved person escaping from an English or a Dutch master, and of course the Dutch mainly reflects the presence of Curaçao off the coast of Venezuela, anybody escaping slavery and arriving in a Spanish colony and promised to become a Roman Catholic and the men serve in the military, they would be set free. And this starts in the 1680s. It was a way to undermine the economy of the Spanish enemies. And this was quite effective. There were a number of slaves, starting almost immediately, escaping from Carolina, from Charleston and its vicinity, so much so that you may have heard of the Stono Rebellion in the 1730s. Well, those people murdered a large number of whites, and they were heading south to St. Augustine because they had heard about the promise of the Spanish that there would be freedom. And Governor Manuel de Montiano had enough free blacks living in St. Augustine that he established a separate town for them two miles north of the city, and its official title is Gracia Real de Santa Teresa de Mose, Mose being an old Timucuan landscape term. But most people just call it Fort Mose. And it is a National Historic Landmark, and it has a state park containing some of the site. 
And that's where this freeback community was established in 1738. That's all well and good until the siege of 1740 by General Oglethorpe. The village of Mose was abandoned. The people came into St. Augustine for safety, and some of the invaders from the Carolinas took over that position. The Spanish, when they abandoned the fort, had broken the gate. And there were South Carolina militia, as well as regular British Army Highland troops that encamped there. Well, the breaking point of the 1740 siege was a counterattack by the Spanish, largely made up of Africans and Indian allies led by Spaniards against Fort Mose. And it was a complete rout of the English. Many people were killed or captured. The commander, Colonel Palmer, was killed. And this very much demoralized the British attacking forces, so much so that ever since then, the people of Carolina referred to it as Bloody Mose. The South Carolina legislature was shocked that the forces would be lost like this and blamed General Oglethorpe, who had just recently established the colony of Georgia. So the free blacks stayed in St. Augustine for several years. And then in the 1750s, Mose was reestablished. And by 1759, there were 84 persons living at Mose. So while we say it was large, it's large relatively. It is significant for being a first. It is significant for being a royal pain to the British colonists. And this slave sanctuary policy remained intact until 1786 when the United States government finally forced Spain to abandon that because they were still seeing enslaved people now in the United States fleeing to Spanish Florida after the American Revolution. I was just going to say that it sounds like this free black community of Mose and Spain's slave sanctuary policy in particular would have caused a lot of kinks and problems for the slaveholding societies of the southern parts of British America and later the United States. Later on, this is why Andrew Jackson invades Florida. As I said, the border between the two empires is the flashpoint. Slavery is a major element of that because the economy of the southern British colonies were so closely dependent upon slave labor. And here we have the Spanish colony say, hey, come over here and we'll set you free as long as you become Roman Catholic and help us fight the British or the Americans. So often, the history of the United States is talked about without talking about the opposition, of whether it's a British colony or a French colony or the later United States. And you've got to hear both sides of the story to understand the causes of this conflict. I know we've just touched the surface of this rich history and legacy of colonial St. Augustine, but I wonder if we could talk a little bit about the changes in imperial rule that happened for St. Augustine in Florida, because these two areas experienced several changes in imperial governance. So from 1565 to 1763, St. Augustine was a Spanish colony. And then in 1763, at the end of the Seven Years' War, control of St. Augustine in Florida passed to the British. Charles, would you tell us how St. Augustine became a British city and what being a British city meant for St. Augustine's Spanish-speaking inhabitants. In 1762, towards the end of the Seven Years' War, Great Britain had captured Havana, Cuba, one of the great cities of the Spanish Empire in the Caribbean. The Spanish desperately wanted Havana and, of course, the control of the rest of Cuba back. So in the peace treaty negotiations, Florida was given up to Great Britain in return for Cuba. The Spanish evacuated their population. So there's almost a complete change in population in 1763. There were about 3,000 people living in St. Augustine and vicinity. When the evacuation was complete, there was probably about 30. That includes five families and their enslaved workforce. Two of those five families had their origins in New York, John Gordon and Jesse Fish. 
Now, both of them had been representing New York mercantile houses in Florida for a number of years. Fish had been here since the 1730s. So you have this complete population change. Even the remnants of the Native Americans, the Huales, the Yamases that had escaped British persecution in the Carolinas and Georgia and moved to Florida, the Tamuqua, all those Indians left and went to Guanabacoa in Cuba, which was not quite an Indian reservation, but it was the town that had the remnants of the Cuban Indian population in it. So when the first British governor, Governor Grant, arrived, he had an empty province. And so this is why when he calls a Congress of Indian tribes that would be influenced by the British in the Southeast, he had this new group, the Seminoles, arrive because They were coming into Florida to fill this void. They were removing themselves from being controlled by the Lower Creeks, their brethren in Alabama and South Georgia, and settling in the Tallahassee area and in the Gainesville area. The British set up a treaty policy with them. All right, these Native Americans, you're going to receive so much in gifts every year from the British crown. We're going to set up trading posts at this location and that location along the St. John's River. We're not going to send white settlers west of the St. John's River. So you had this treaty arrangement with the incoming British. So the British, generally speaking, have pretty good relationships with the Native Americans because the Native Americans liked British trading goods, whether that was guns or tobacco or cloth. The Panton Leslie Company store, which ran those Indian trading posts, was kind of like a mini Hudson's Bay company. And it had two stores on the St. John's River, one in St. Augustine, one in Pensacola, one in Natchez, several in Alabama. So they were a big time operation in the Southeast. And you have to remember that one of the other geopolitical things that happened with the British takeover of Florida is that the boundary between Georgia and Florida was fixed at the St. Mary's River, where it is today. It had been in a state of flux between the Spanish and the British before then. But you also have to remember that Florida extended all the way to the Mississippi River. Natchez was part of Florida. So the British divided this vast area into two provinces, East and West Florida, with East Florida having its capital in St. Augustine and West Florida having its capital in Pensacola. So the British administration of the Floridas was very different from the Spanish. Also, the British decided that St. Augustine, with its major fortification, would be a great place to have the major British army installation for all of the southeast of North America. So they expanded the barracks arrangements here. They took over the old monastery, converted it into a barracks, built another new barracks, which had been prefabricated in New York and shipped down here so that still there was this strong military presence in St. Augustine. And it spread far beyond St. Augustine because this was the major army post prior and during the American Revolution for the British Army in the southeast. You have this wholesale change in population. So Governor Grant looked around and said, all right, how am I going to populate this place? Okay, let's follow the model of Jamaica or South Carolina and have this tiny ownership elite, and we'll get all of our labor from enslaved Africans. And we'll also turn the economy over to cash crops. So they start importing slaves in great numbers, either directly from Africa or from South Carolina or other places in the Caribbean. And he gives huge land grants to politically influential people in Britain, members of parliament, members of the Lords of Trade. We have the names of those people stuck on our landscape today, like Lord Egmont. So we have Egmont Key. So we develop this sort of agribusiness model with this large enslaved African workforce during the British period. Florida was strictly British. The Catholic Church becomes defunct. The Anglican Church is established. And then a weird thing happens. Andrew Turnbull, who was from South Carolina, he's a physician, a man of science in the 18th century. And he realizes that whenever 
British people are brought to tropical climates, they drop like flies because tropical diseases affect them. So as a man of science, he has a theory. He's going to bring people from a hot climate. So he starts collecting indentured servants in the Mediterranean in 1767 and 68. So he gets a lot of Italians and Menorcans. You have to remember that the island of Menorca was a British possession at that time. It was a Navy base. So he uses that as his staging point, and most of the people that came in 1768, and there were approximately 3,000, were from Menorca. So today we call their descendants Menorcans. And these people were Roman Catholic, but they were not Spanish speakers. They were Catalan speakers. So they came over, and Dr. Turnbull and his business partners established a huge plantation at what is today New Smyrna Beach. So this plantation was designed for agribusiness. The cash crop was going to be indigo, and it was very badly managed and very badly planned. There was a great deal of starvation, so much so that after nine years, now the indentured servitude contracts were for 10 years, but after nine years, a few of the settlers escaped to St. Augustine and petitioned the second British governor of East Florida, Patrick Tonin, to get released from their indentured servitude because of the harsh conditions in New Smyrna. I said there was close to 3,000 people that came. Nine years later, there were 800. And that includes natural increase. So it was a horrendous experience. So when you say how British was St. Augustine, after the governor in 1777 allowed the New Smyrna indentured servants to get out of there and move to St. Augustine, the majority of the population here was Catalan speaking and some Italians and Greeks thrown in. So again, it was a very polyglot population, in addition to all the Africans speaking various languages from different parts of Africa. So while it had British soldiers and had a British governor, and it had a British church, it was not as British as you might think. Now, although Florida became a British colony in 1763, Florida did not join the other 13 British American colonies in declaring independence from Great Britain. And at the end of the American War for Independence, Great Britain returned St. Augustine and Florida to the Spanish as a result of the Treaty of Versailles, 1783. Charles, would you tell us about the American Revolution in Florida and how St. Augustine, at the end of the American Revolution, went back to being a Spanish colony? Sure. The American Revolution's impact on St. Augustine was largely as a place of refuge at a prison camp. So loyalists who were being persecuted in the Carolinas and in Georgia fled to St. Augustine. One of the reasons that Governor Tonin let the Menorcans out of their indentured contract was because Andrew Turnbull was from South Carolina, he had his suspicions that him and some of his friends, like William Drayton, who was the chief justice of East Florida, might have sympathies towards the revolutionaries. So by freeing his indentured servants, he cut the economics off of Turnbull's establishment here and thus left his probably most revolutionary citizen without economics to support him. Now, William Drayton, who was removed from office by Tonin, and Andrew Turnbull actually went to England and petitioned Parliament for redress, and they won, but it took so long that the American Revolution was over by then, and both of those people, after the Revolution, resettle in Charleston. And William Drayton, for instance, becomes the first federal judge in Charleston. So the huge number of refuge, the population of St. Augustine swelled from around 2,000 to around 10,000 due to the refugees. And the British thought they were going to be able to keep Florida because they had this strong presence of loyalists and their enslaved workforce. But then Bernardo de Galvez goes and captures Pensacola. And that tied up a lot of the forces that may have aided Cornwallis in the Southern Campaign. So at the Treaty of Versailles, not the Treaty of Paris, the Treaty of Paris was between the United States and Great Britain. The Treaty of Versailles the next day was between France and Spain and Great Britain. They determined to 
return Florida to Spain, since Spain already occupied the province of West Florida. This surprised the people in East Florida. So the British said, all right, we're going to compensate you for what you have to abandon. And some of our best information about this time period comes from the Loyalist land claims of what they left behind, because they detailed what was on their farms and plantations down to the hen houses. And a lot of these people went to Canada. A lot of these people went to the Bahamas and other places in the Caribbean. But some of the Brits decided to stay on because they had land here and they didn't want to give it up. The Menorcans were given land, so they had established themselves. So they were not loyal to the British crown, and they also knew that the Spanish would return the Catholic Church to its dominance in Florida. So they saw a bright future in Spanish East Florida under Spanish control. This regime change had people who were very upset, the loyalists, and people who said, oh, this is opportunity for us, like the Menorcans. So it's a complicated time period. It was a complicated time period, and it seems to have only become more complicated as time went on because in 1821, the Adams Onus Treaty transfers control of just East Florida, including St. Augustine, to the United States. And then by 1845, the United States gets West Florida, and all of Florida joins the United States as the 27th state. So, would you tell us how Spanish Florida became the United States' Florida, Charles? Yes. Again, it's complicated. The second Spanish period, that time period between 1784 and 1821, there were a number of rebellions and invasions. Fernandina, Florida, which is right on the border of Georgia, prides itself as the Isle of Five Flags because it had so many people who ruled it or pretended to rule it, including a couple of pirates over its long history. But there were continual revolts. There was a revolt in 1795 that was inspired by the French Revolution. There was also a filibustering movement by Anglo planters north of St. Augustine along the St. John's River and the St. Mary's River in 1811 and 12 called the Patriot War. This was led by John Houston McIntosh as the first president of the Republic of East Florida. We have this capture of Fernandina in 1817 by Gregor McGregor, who had been a general in Simon Bolivar's army in South America. You have Andrew Jackson, who was not happy with the slaves running away to Florida. Even though the slave sanctuary policy had been abandoned in 1786 by the Spanish, the slaves in southern states were now setting themselves up with the Seminoles as some servient villages to the Seminole chiefs. And so he invades West Florida, Pensacola, he gets as far east as the Suwannee River in 1817. So West Florida was already under the control of the United States. And we keep having these little revolutions and Indian revolts because the Spanish were not quite as good at pacifying Indians as the English had been. It was a nightmare for the Spanish. And the Spanish, you have to remember that during this late 18-teens, early 1820s, the empire was falling apart. This is right after the Napoleonic Wars, where Napoleon had put one of his brothers as a puppet king on the throne of Spain, and the Spanish parliament was sitting in the city of Cadiz, protected by the British fleet, promulgating a liberal constitution. And so in 1813, We erect a monument to the first Spanish constitution, a very liberal document, although it still was a constitutional monarchy. And King Ferdinand VII of Spain was under house arrest in Bayonne, France. The empire was falling apart. We have Hidalgo's revolution in Mexico. We have Simón Bolívar in South America. The Spanish had bigger fish to fry than an unprofitable colony here. So, you know, it took a long time. The adams onís Treaty was actually signed in 1817, but it took a long time to be finalized on the ground so that it wasn't until July 10th, 1821, that the transfer of East Florida on the ground occurs. Charles, your role as a senior research librarian at the St. Augustine Historical Society must allow you to think about St. Augustine and the different roles it has played in early American history a lot. So would you tell us 
what you think are the most important contributions that St. Augustine has made to the early American past and why you think we should study its history more than we actually do? Well, I mentioned this earlier in that we're the border between empires, whether it's initially France and Spain or the Indian peoples and Spain or the British and Spain. What other city in America has been attacked and burned by Sir Francis Drake in 1586? So the story of Florida and St. Augustine is a story of conflict between these imperial powers. And you can't see the whole story if you're only listening to the French or the Anglo side of the question. That conflict is the story of North America. We should move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. Charles, in your opinion, what might have happened if Florida had never been returned to the Spanish following the American War for Independence? How do you think the history of Florida and the United States may have been different? I think the War of 1812 would have been very different. The Brits would have played a much larger role in the South. Can you imagine if you had the British Army in a major military post here in St. Augustine attacking Savannah by land and sea? We think of Jackson at the very end of the war protecting New Orleans from a large British invasion fleet. Well, what if they already controlled that area? So the War of 1812 may have come out very different. And I think the boundaries between the British Empire and the American Empire would have been very different, not just in Canada, but in the southern tier of North America as well. Charles. I think you piqued a lot of our curiosities and may have even inspired some of us to start planning our next visit to St. Augustine and the St. Augustine Historical Society. Would you tell us whether you have any special exhibits or exhibitions or events coming up that we should plan around? Yes, we have an annual journal called El Escribano, and very soon we're going to be publishing the next issue, which is entitled Valiant Soldiers, which is about the blacks who served in the U.S. colored troops who were from St. Augustine during the Civil War. We also produce a little newsletter called the East Florida Gazette, which has short history pieces. I'm going to be writing one for the May issue about the 100th anniversary of our museum. We own the oldest purpose-built museum in the state of Florida, next to our museum house, the oldest house, which we've owned since 1918 which was first opened to the public in 1892 by a private individual. So it's one of the oldest house museums in the country. Our website is staughs.com. And we have a lot of online exhibits. For instance, there's one there that talks about the Day of Jubilee, all the Emancipation Day celebrations here in St. Augustine with eyewitness accounts. There's a blog with little short tidbits of information. We have the online catalog to our book collection and our photographic collection. So we've got some terrific resources for people. There are some other resources that people might be interested in. Dr. Michael Francis has developed a website at the University of South Florida called laflorida.org. And he is telling the story of the earliest settlers. And he has also put up online the Roman Catholic Church records. Now, the baptisms and marriages start in 1595. These are the earliest Catholic Church documents in what is now the United States. It's a terrific resource that has been underutilized. I also want to point out that the records for the Second Spanish Period, 1784 to 1821, was put up by the Library of Congress up online. They've only been available on microfilm before this. It has everything from wills to censuses to governor's correspondence to people petitioning the governor to 
trading documents to ships' passports to slave manumissions. The list goes on and on and on. If we have more questions about the history of St. Augustine, or if we'd like to come and visit the St. Augustine Historical Society, its oldest house museum, or check out some of the great historical records you have, how can we get in contact with you and find this information? Well, as I said, I gave you the website a moment ago. So that's S-T-A-U-G-H-S dot com. And that has a link to the research library. Anyone can contact me at charles at S-A-H-S 1883.com. There are some terrific websites. The National Park Service website for the Castillo de San Marcos is a wonderful resource, as well as Visit St. Augustine, which is a commercial site, but it tells you what events are happening in town and it's kept up to date. Charles Stingley, thank you for introducing us to the history of St. Augustine and of early Florida. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's been a great pleasure. St. Augustine served as the northern edge of the Spanish Empire in North America. It was a touch point where the imperial powers of indigenous peoples, the French, and the English came face to face with the Spanish on the northern and eastern edge of Spain's American Empire. St. Augustine was also the place where the Spanish launched its Franciscan missionizing project. According to the Florida Division of Historical Resources, the Franciscans established at least 40 missions between St. Augustine and the western border of the Florida Panhandle. In comparison, the Franciscans established 21 missions in California, 11 missions in Arizona, somewhere between 25 and 30 missions in New Mexico, and 26 missions in Texas. Now, as Charles revealed, St. Augustine's position at the northern edge of Spain's North American empire and its role in Franciscan missionary work meant that most residents in St. Augustine worked for the Spanish colonial government, the Spanish military, or the Franciscan order of the Catholic Church. St. Augustine was not a place where you'd find a lot of fertile farms and agricultural work, given the area's sandy soils and its position on the Atlantic coastline of Florida. In fact, as Charles reminded us, Florida didn't really offer the Spanish any trade goods or cash crops. To survive, Florida had to rely on tax dollars coming in from Mexico. It wasn't until the English period of 1763 to 1783 that Florida started to develop profitable trade goods such as pitch and tar for ships. Now, the way Florida changed imperial hands over and over again really highlights how the city of St. Augustine and the area we now know as the state of Florida was a highly contested area. The French wanted the peninsula for reasons of trade and religion. The English desired Florida as a place it could use to hunt the Spanish treasure fleet. And the British and later the United States desired Florida simply to protect slavery by ending the Spanish slave sanctuary policy. Early America, with its complex indigenous societies, invading colonizers, and power-hungry empires, was an ever-changing and messy historical place. And it's through the history of borderland outposts like St. Augustine, where we can see this messiness, the messiness of the period, play out in an up-close way. You'll find more information about Charles, the St. Augustine Historical Society, plus notes, links, and a transcript for everything we talked about today, all on the show notes page. BenFranklinsWorld.com slash 358. Friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts. So if you enjoy Ben Franklin's World, please tell your friends and family about it. Production assistance for this podcast comes from my colleagues at the Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. Joseph Edelman, Holly White, Ian Tona, and Taylor Fisher. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. Finally, there are lots of cities, towns, peoples, and places that we have yet to discuss on this podcast. So what have we missed that you'd really like to explore? Tell me. Liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios.